Psalm 122 is in a, one of the ascent psalms. It's, it's, it's lovely. This is a lovely psalm. It comes right after Psalm 121, which is a favorite of everyone's. You know, that first verse, um, I will lift my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Well, 22 comes right after that, 122. And I'm just going to read the first five verses today. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together, whither the tribes go up the tribes of the Lord, under the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Why don't you stand with me this morning and we'll enter into a word of prayer. Father, we just ask today that you would bless us as we come into your house, Father, to worship you, Father, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask, Lord, that uh, you would help us today as we give thanks unto your name, for all the wonderful things that you've done for us. Lord, bless our brother um, uh, Alan Barker right now as he's in the hospital. Give the doctors and the nurses that care for him compassion for him. And we pray, Lord, that you'd speak to us now in this hour. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, family. We're going to start this morning with our fellowship hymn, number 133, The Blood Will Never Lose Its Power. Turn with me to uh, John 17. All right, well, you have your Bible there in John chapter 17. We're going to look today at verses 9, 10, and 11. John chapter 17. We're going to look today at verses 9, 10, and 11. So we're in this series of messages focused on John 17. I'm just going to go through here little at a time, and I'm looking at the calendar this morning thinking, well, I, Easter's coming, and um, we're not even close uh, to the end of John 17, so we'll probably just carry on with John 17 after Easter, um, but we've got, we've got a few Sundays left before that. Uh, we're talking about John 17, which is Christ's great prayer. We've read the first three verses about the agency of God. We took a look at verses 4 and 5, the glory of God. Last week, we examined 6 through 8 and considered what Jesus had to say about the Word of God. And today, Jesus is praying his prayer 
uh, we're going to look at verses 9 through 11 as he prays for his disciples. He prays for his disciples. So let me read the passage here in, uh, in John 17, 9, 10, and 11. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we ask that you'd help us today as we meditate on this wonderful passage, the words of our Savior. Lord, give us, uh, give us today the unction of the Spirit of God that we might hear it and, and that uh, the Spirit of God might speak to us by it. Give me strength of my weakness today and unction to preach. Uh, watch over us now as we consider this prayer of Christ, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So have we had the word prayer yet in this passage? We know it's a prayer because the way Jesus starts off, he lifts his eyes to heaven and says, Father, the hour has come, so we know he's praying. And he's having this conversation with his Father. And we come to verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me. And so he continues his praying. I have manifested thy name. They have known all things. I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And then we come to verse 9, and he says, I pray for them. So here we have prayer, the word prayer for the first time. And a new section, because now in John 17, he's not praying this general kind of prayer about God glorifying him and the, the, the giving of the Lord and the election of these men and all of that. But now it's specifically for them. Notice verse 9 there. I pray for them. And this section will go from verse 9 all the way down to verse 18. So he's praying for his disciples in this 10, 11 verse section here from 9 to 19 uh, in which he's addressing the Father on their behalf. And then when we come to verse, I'm sorry, 9 through 18. No, it's 9 through 19. And then in verse 20, he says, Neither pray I for, for these alone, but for them also which shall be, believe on me through their word. So from 20 to 26, he's going to pray for the, the rest of the church. That's us. All those that believe on, them, or believe on me because of their word. So the apostles' word is now what we have. And we're believing on Jesus because of the apostles' words. And so he's praying for us in the last part of this uh, of this prayer, but let's focus now on this part where he's praying for these disciples. And notice what he says here, I pray for them. What a blessing that is. What a blessing that is. Now we know Jesus is praying for his disciples, those 12 men. And he's, he's praying for them, or those 11 men. He's praying for those guys, okay? But what a blessing that we see here that the mediator intercedes for his own. And cannot we extrapolate from that, that because the Bible tells us that he intercedes for us as well, now, even today, in heaven, he's praying for us too. The Father is praying, or the, the Son is praying to the Father for us. We have an intercessor. It's wonderful when we say to one another, would you pray for me? Or it's wonderful when we pray for one of our brothers and sisters. And I'm sure that we do that quite often. But just imagine that all the time, every day, we have a Savior in heaven who's praying specifically for us. And it doesn't occupy him to the point where he can't pray for us one day because he's got to pray for somebody else. He's praying for us all the time. But not just us individually. He's praying for Creek Road Baptist Church. And he's praying for all the churches that are in Christ. He's praying for everybody that's a part of the visible church. How marvelous is that? What a comfort is that? And let me just ask you a question. Did these men need for Jesus to pray for them? Well, you can answer that question by saying, well, he needs to pray for me. And if he needs to pray for me, I know that he needs to pray for them. 
Yeah. Do we need him to pray for us? Yeah. Did Peter need Jesus to pray for him? Oh, yeah. And you know Peter. But Peter's not alone in that category, is he? No, Peter. Peter's a little hot-tempered, fiery guy. Goes off the handle. He's sometimes a fraidy cat. Um, you know, doesn't do what he needs to do. And so Jesus is praying for Peter because Peter needs prayer. And Jesus is praying for David Smith because David Smith needs prayer. And he's praying for you because you need prayer. He's, he's interceding for us. What a marvelous thought that is. I mean, right here, we could just stop. I pray for them, he says. That's beautiful. What a need we have for prayer. And <clears throat> I've told you, and I will tell you again, if Jesus had a need to pray for us, how much more do we have a need to pray? Notice what he says next. In, if you're reading a King James Bible, you have a hard stop here. It's a full colon. I pray for them. Full colon right here. It's a hard stop. It's a break in the thought. And then he proceeds. He says, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. Now, don't think for a moment that Jesus has abandoned the world here. You know, so we, we read that, we're, like, we're maybe just a little bit shocked, you know. We, he's not praying for the world. He, no, but Jesus is focused on his men. He doesn't abandon the world. Just compare John 3, 16 and 17, what, what Jesus says about the world. For God so loved the world. That hasn't changed. Uh, Jesus, when he says, uh, he says, I don't pray, I pray not for the world, doesn't mean that he's abandoned you know, his desire for the world to come to him. No, it's not, a, not at all, because he told us in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent his son, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. There's that word world again. It's all over the place in John 3, 16 and 17. So what is he telling us in those passages? Well, he's telling us that there's a plan for the world, that the world men are going to be called out of, and they're going to be called out of the world because they believe in Jesus Christ. And that has been provided for. You know, all the world needs has been furnished by Christ on the cross. It's all the world needs. And so it's, when he says here, I don't pray for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. This prayer is specific. Jesus adjusts his focus here. Sometimes, you know, when we pray, we do the exact same thing. You know, uh, our heart is opened, perhaps, by a specific passage of Scripture. And the Spirit of God whispers in our ear, you need to pray about this. Or perhaps we're impressed to pray for someone by the moving of the Holy Spirit. Or perhaps we are requested to pray for someone uh, you know, like last night, uh, you know, you all got the text about Brother Barker being in the hospital, and you prayed for him last night. Well, it's not that you didn't want to pray for somebody else, you know. It wasn't that you didn't want to pray for a lost relative, or you didn't want to pray for something else, or you didn't want to pray about whatever it was that happened to be on your heart, but a request had been made, and so you lifted up a specific person in prayer. And that's exactly what the Savior is doing right here. You know, those times uh, we're not unconcerned about other things or persons, but we're focused on the one thing or the one person or the one group of people. Notice how the gift of God in this passage is repeated here. Again, Jesus keeps the election of God front and center in this prayer. Notice what he says, I pray not for the world, but for them which you have given me. Again, we have that idea of the Father giving. The Father has been giving in John 17 from the very beginning, from the very first verse. We've had the Father giving and giving and giving, and we've seen it over and over again. Here it is again, right here in this ninth verse. These men which you have given me. So we know exactly who it is that Jesus is praying about. We know that he's not, you know, this is not him abandoning others but it's just he's praying for these men because they need prayer thank God thank God now 
<clears throat> After he says this in verse 9, we have that phrase right there at the end, for they are thine, and then notice verse 10. So I'm going to put together the last phrase in 9 and then uh, what we have there at the beginning of verse 10. For they are thine, all mine are thine, and thine are mine. How about them apples? Huh? Yeah. Who is Jesus? Who is God? Can we distinguish either one of them here? Again, another one of the finest statements of divine identity given in the New Testament. Now, I know I said last week that the one we had last week was the finest of all. And I was, you know, I, I was, that was preacherish of me, you know, to, to, to claim that. But I come to this one today and I say, friends, oh, my friends, if we could unravel with our minds all the meaning here, it would take us the rest of eternity to, to do it. Look at this. They are thine, all mine are thine, and thine are mine. What a beautiful statement. The statement really is, this statement here is a braided cord which is unbreakable. I was thinking about it this morning as Jonah sang. I was looking at this, the I am banner over here on, on uh, my left, your right, and the three rings and how they, how they blend together, but they overlap in different ways, you know, and they create the symbol of Trinity for us. It's just a symbol, but I was thinking to myself about this passage and just how all of this intertwines and braids itself together. So really, suddenly, in just these few words, Jesus and the Father become undistinguishable from one another. I mean, we have, we have self identified by thine and mine, but because of the way it's said, Thine and all mine are thine, and thine are mine. And suddenly we realize that the Father and the Son are one. As I said, and I will back off my statement from last week just a little bit, one of the finest statements of divine identity ever uttered by the Savior right here in John, 9, John 17, 9 and 10. The disciples belong to the Father. The disciples of Jesus belong to the Father. The disciples of the Father belong to Jesus. Hmm. This reminds us of John chapter 10. In John 10, he says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Yeah. So you, who do you belong to? You belong to the Jesus? Do you belong to the Father? The answer is yes. You, in Christ, belong to the Godhead. And that includes all three. And then at the end there of uh, verse 10, he says this, I am glorified in them. So he gives us this beautiful braided statement of divinity and trinity there at the end of 9 of the first part of 10. And then he says... I am glorified in them. Now, this is a wonderful thing, isn't it? That we might actually be able to glorify this great God. Here is a wonderful clue to the glorious work of the church. What is our purpose? We have it right here. Black and white, in ink, in your Bible, on your phone. However you're reading your Bible, it's right there. I am glorified in them. Our purpose, ladies and gentlemen, is to glorify God. Listen to the Westminster Shorter Catechism. The very first question and answer in the Westminster Shorter Catechism is this. What is the chief end of man? And the answer? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Oh, that's so beautiful. And so true. And, and then... The Westminster Catechism adds these two verses, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, and Psalm 73, 25, and 26. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. 
I ask you the question as I ask myself the question. How you doing on that? How you doing in glorifying God like that? It's a challenge, isn't it? I'm not telling you I do it right every day, and I know you don't do it right every day because we're human and we got stuff that comes at us from all sides. And sometimes it's tough to keep that in mind whenever we're, whatever we're doing. Because he says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, well, that includes a lot of things. Glorifying God, sometimes I'm not even thinking about that. And I know that's just, that's just the way we are. But what a challenge that is. What a purpose we have. What a glorious, ladies and gentlemen, what a glorious work is set down before us. The will of God for us is to glorify Christ. Psalm 73, responding to the last part of the catechism there when it says, and enjoy him forever. Uh, They reference Psalm 73 where David writes, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart fails, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Oh, to enjoy him, to enjoy him and glorify him. And Jesus said, they're mine, they're yours, they're ours, and I'm glorified in them. Notice that it's I am glorified in them. What have the disciples done to glorify Jesus? Believed in him, that's it, that's all. They didn't have anything to bring to the relationship. All they had was their belief, their faith that they placed in him. That's it. That's all they had. And he says, I'm glorified in them. Oh, friends, just simply to believe, just simply to walk in hand in hand with Christ, that is enough. But yet there's so much more. There's so much more that Paul tells us there in 1 Corinthians in the whatsoever. <laughs> Let the whatsoever be grand. Let it be glorious. Let me engage in whatsoever so that I might glorify my God and King. Because he saved me. He redeemed me. Yes, just like, those, uh, just like the children of Israel when they marched out of Egypt singing their song of praise. He has marched me out of my bondage and captivity. He has translated me from darkness into the kingdom of light. Oh, let us glorify him today. Now notice verse 11. The need of prayer. Now, we've had the subject of this prayer. He says, I pray for them. And then he defines it. I'm not praying for the world, but I'm praying for those that you gave me. So we know exactly who the prayer is about. Those men, all the, you know, the thines and the minds and the so forth and all that, that beautiful braid of divinity. And he says, I'm glorified in them. So we know the subject, the disciples. Now he's going to tell us about this prayer, the need of the prayer. And Jesus says there in verse 11, and now I am no more in the world. Jesus is leaving. Notice that, and now, he says. Here's the, here's the, the hour again. You remember? We began with the hour. The hour is come, and we've been in the hour. So now Jesus refers back to that hour again. Now refers back to the hour. Now I am no more in the world. Jesus knew he was going. He knew it was coming shortly, and he knew he was leaving these disciples. And the disciples, they had the physical comfort of the Savior with them in the world. You know, there was not going to be any more suppers around the table with him. There was, no, there was not going to be any more leaning upon his breast. None of that was going to happen. He wasn't going to hold their hand any longer. He wasn't going to steal the waters any longer. He, you know, he wasn't going to be asleep in the back of the boat, you know, reclining in the back of the boat. He wasn't going to be feeding the 5,000. So none of that physical comfort of his presence, his bodily presence was going to be with them. And so now Jesus is going to pray for them. He says, I am no more in the world, but these are. The disciples are staying. The world's still going to have storms. The world's still going to have troubles. The world's still going to have problems. Jesus says, here's what I'm praying now. I'm praying for them. We know the subject and the need of the prayer is, I'm leaving, they're not. The world and its corrupt system will treat the disciples as it treated Jesus. And should we expect not even worse than that? What a need for the Savior to pray. And of course, this is still our need. You know, we're still in the world. We still have a Savior who's praying for us. And oh my 
do we not need the Savior to pray? So the need for prayer is Jesus is leaving, they're staying, and then the place where needs are met, he shows us in this prayer. He says, I come to thee, Holy Father. Ladies and gentlemen, if Jesus needed to pray, how much more do we? And where does he go when the, he's leaving, the disciples are staying? Does he try to give them a plan for you know, dealing with stuff? Or does he go to the Father and ask the Father to help? He goes to the Father. That's what he does. He goes to heaven. And he says, oh, holy Father, notice the request. I come to thee, holy Father, keep them. And we'll get to that in just a second. The Bible teaches us that the only true place for redress is at the Father's knees. Psalm 118, we quoted that this morning after Jonah's song. And I have it here in my notes as well. I called upon the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. Is he? Is the Lord on your side? I will not fear. What can man do unto me? The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Does he? Yes, he does. Call on the Lord in your distress. Because remember, he's in heaven, but you're still here. And there are still plenty of storms. Come to the Holy Father. And call upon the Lord in your distress. The Lord is with you in that. And he'll take your part with them that help you. The request then is this. <clears throat> there at the end of verse 11. Keep. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. How wonderful it is to be kept by the Father. And what a wonderful request by the Savior for these men. That God would keep them. And they, they needed that, and so do we. And think of that. What a wonderful thing it is for us to make that same prayer. <clears throat> we have a need, but so many of us <clears throat> know folk that have needs as well, don't we? Who are those people? How about if we go to the Holy Father and say, Holy Father, keep Joe, keep Jane, keep John. Keep Jimmy, keep him. And we don't even know what that means, but we know that God does. And in the entirety of the life of that individual, when we pray, Lord, keep so-and-so, we're making a powerful prayer that our Savior teaches us right here in John chapter 17. Because when he said keep, he knew exactly what the Lord needed to do to keep those men. And he prayed it, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. What a wonderful request by the Savior. What a wonderful request to teach us how to pray for others as well. And then, here's what the keeping produces. Notice that next phrase. That they may be one as we are. As we are. Again, where, where are you going to find a, a more beautiful description of the divinity of Father and Son than right here in John 17? That they may be one as we, as, as we are. The unity of the Spirit. The unity of purpose. The esprit de corps, in a sense. That unity of purpose that gives direction to a group of people. And he's praying for them that they, so he's praying for all of them, that they may be one with one purpose, one mind, the mind of Christ, one heartbeat, one one you know, direction in, to take the church. He's praying for that kind of unity. You know, and unity breaks down when we take our eyes off of our purpose and focus on our will and way. I have in the many years that I've pastored seen other churches who have dissolved into nothing because of disunity. One group has an idea, another group doesn't like that idea, and friction starts and they divide and the church is divided, so much so that they even sit on different sides of the building when they come in. They don't talk to one another. Boy, I've seen that. I've seen churches where people don't talk to each other. They don't like each other. If you ask them to pray for somebody, they would never do it. 
because there's disunity and discord. It's because they want their own way. They want their own thing. They're not willing to lay down their wills and humble themselves under the one single purpose to glorify God. And you know what happens. <clears throat> Splits come about. <clears throat> Christ is dishonored. The word of God is diminished because the preaching of the gospel doesn't happen. And ministry is set aside for selfishness. And Jesus prays that they may be one. Oh, friend, how we need that prayer. Not only do we need him to pray for us that, he, that the Lord would keep us, but we need prayer that we would have oneness. But it's just not any oneness. It's the same oneness that the Father has with the Son. And I want to tell you something. The only way that that can happen in a group of people is if that group of people, every one of them, belongs to Christ. Only can there be unity in a group if that group all belong to Christ Jesus. Then we understand the unity of the Father and the Son. If you have a mixed group of people, some saved, some not, you're going to have division. Because one understands unity and the other does not understand unity. They understand their own will. But inside the body of Christ, there's always going to be unity because we understand the very purpose of God. So how do we apply this? Well, I think we've sort of done some application all the way through this passage, <clears throat> 9, 10, and 11. Again, you know, just put an asterisk beside it. I'm going to say it every time. If Jesus prayed, ladies and gentlemen, how much more do we need to pray? And not only just to pray for things and stuff, but to pray for individuals and to be, be single-minded about praying for someone. Now, not all the time, you know, but there are times when, folks, we just need to bear down and pray for, you know, John Doakes. And just ask and just lift up John Doakes because John Doakes is making some poor decisions or he's having a tough time or he's in surgery or his wife is thinking about leaving him or his children are a mess. You know, there's, there are times when we just got to put John Doakes on the front burner. Jesus teaches us that right here. Right here, let's get specific in our prayers and pray for men and pray just like Jesus did that the Holy Father would keep them and bring oneness to them. Because we live in a world filled with storms and fires. And every single one of us are going to face it, especially if we're in Christ, because they don't want to see the likeness of Christ in us. And we need to pray for one another. That's, that's one thing. The other thing is we really need to think about the whatsoevers in our everyday life so that we might glorify Christ. We need to remember the whatsoevers. We need to remember that during the whatsoevers, it's our, it's our privilege to glorify him. And so let's begin to be a little more intentional about the whatsoevers. I remember when I was, uh, I've, I've told this before, it just comes to mind right now, uh, I was sitting on an airplane pulling into Tel Aviv Airport and they were having the Feast of Pentecost uh, that weekend and I was talking to a Jewish lady seated beside me and she was saying, you know the thing about the, thing about the Jewish dietary laws is they make you think about what you're eating and I thought to myself, you know that's, that's kind of the whatsoever command in 1 Corinthians it's not about diet but just whether I eat or drink or whatsoever I do, so whatever it is that I'm doing, am I glorifying my Savior? What a marvelous challenge that is for the church. And I think just doctrinally what we can say about this passage for us is just to be reminded that this, this relationship between Christ Jesus and his Father is deep. It is a strong braided cord that we will never be able to undo. And maybe it will take the rest of eternity for us to understand. But all that he says here in just those few simple words, what depth, what depth, who is Jesus? He is God Almighty. He's not just some prophet that came. No, he is God himself in human flesh. This was none other than the Father in appearance before 
the world, the Son Himself, begotten of the Father, only begotten of the Father, present in human flesh. I don't think we understand the depth and the beauty of that, but, oh, friend, we can glorify Him because of it. We can make our songs and our prayers and all that we do in Jesus' name because when we say in Jesus' name, we're saying the Father's name. Because the Father and He are one. Oh, how wonderful that is. So let's make our prayers in Jesus' name. Let's take our whatsoevers and dedicate them in Jesus' name. Let's pray for our friends and our loved ones in Jesus' name. Let's pray for the Tajiks in Tajikistan in Jesus' name. And ask God to keep the church there. And to do a mighty work there. All of that is in bounds when we pray. Just as our Savior teaches us here in John chapter 17. Would you bow with me for prayer? Oh, Father, help us strengthen our prayer, deepen us. Help us to understand all this wonderful thing about your divinity <clears throat> and the divinity of our Savior and the wonder and the glory that's there. Father, now as we conclude this morning with our final hymn, that you would speak to our hearts once more as we give ourselves to you. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We'll stand and sing our invitation this morning, number 280, 280, Jesus, keep me near the cross.
Yeah.